Lord God, we ask that you would shine your light on us this morning, that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds, and that in seeing your light, we would know your truth, that your Holy Spirit would help us to receive that truth, to believe that truth, and ultimately to live that truth. We pray, Lord, that we would honor you uh, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Advent and Christmas season began six weeks ago. And it began with the voice of the prophet Isaiah proclaiming, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Inviting us to walk in the light of the Lord. And the Christmas season appropriately ends this morning with a very similar invitation to live in that same light. This past Friday, January the 6th, was the Feast of the Epiphany marks the end of our liturgical celebrations following the 12 days of Christmas. However, there were no gifts of turtle doves, of French hens, lords a-leaping, or partridges in a pear tree on that first epiphany. But rather, the more traditional gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Epiphany comes at the end of the Christmas story and at the beginning of a new calendar year. Epiphany means a bright, shining revelation. It means to show, to make known, or to reveal. And while Epiphany first referred to the revelation of the Christ child to the wise men, it has come to mean any revelation that points to the glory of God in our midst. In this morning's reading uh, that was just read for us by Gail, Matthew writes, In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Now, the story of the wise men is shrouded in mystery. They seem to just show up mysteriously and just as mysteriously, they disappear. I suspect, that's, this is beca- I suspect it's because of this mystery uh, that so many traditions have developed around them. So tradition, for example, has them arriving at the stable along with the shepherds the night that Jesus was born. But, but they probably arrived in Bethlehem at least a year later or possibly more. Some scholars suggest up to five years after Jesus was born. Tradition tells us that there were three of them, the three wise men, and this is probably because three gifts were offered. However, Matthew doesn't tell us how many. He just says that there were wise men, i.e. more than one. Tradition also claims that they were kings, and so we sing, we three kings of Orient are. Scripture, however, says nothing about them being kings. Matthew calls them wise men from the east, or magoi, in the original Greek, which is where we get the word magi, which means of foreign origin, sorcerer, magician, or wise. The fact that they followed a star suggests that they were astrologers or astronomers, a very common occupation in ancient times, but this too is only conjecture. Tradition has also given them names and nationalities. Balthazar, with dark skin, was king of Arabia. Melchior, elderly, with gray hair, was king of Persia. And Caspar, young and beardless, was king of India. Again, scripture, Matthew, says nothing of their names or their nationalities. Tradition says that they journeyed to Bethlehem on camelback. But Matthew is silent as to their mode of transportation. In fact, this morning's reading from Matthew, the only place we meet the three magi, tells us very little about these visitors from the east. What we do know is this. It was the original Star Trek. Right? Long before Kirk, Spock, or Picard, we have these magi from the east, full of wisdom and learning, following a star in search of a newborn king. Now, I don't know about you, but of all of the different aspects 
of the Christmas story, I find the story of the wise men seeking the Christ child to be the most intriguing, precisely because it's shrouded in so much mystery. I also find it intriguing because I believe that it has something important to say to us about seeking Jesus in our own time, in our own generation. So this morning, as we look at this story of the wise men seeking Jesus, I want to look at three lessons, three lessons that can help us in our faith journey in this new year. So lesson number one is a diligent search for God always leads to Jesus. A diligent search for God always leads to Jesus. In his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, uh, preacher John MacArthur writes about the importance of the Magi in ancient Middle Eastern culture. He writes, Because of their combined knowledge of science, agriculture, mathematics, history, and the occult, Magi became the most prominent and powerful group of advisors in the Medo-Persian Empire and subsequently the Babylonian Empire. Historians tell us that no Persian was ever able to become king without mastering the scientific and religious disciplines of the Magi and then being approved and crowned by them. So these guys, whoever they were, were were high up in the culture of the day. And although we don't know much about them, as I've already said, we can surmise, surmise from what little information Matthew gives us that they were from the region east of Israel, in what is now modern-day Iraq or Iran. We can surmise that they had been traveling for a long time, just purely because of the distance, following a strange star in the western sky. Now, some modern-day astronomers theorize that at this time, several planets came into alignment in relation to Earth and would have created what appeared to be an extremely bright star. Others suggest that the star over Bethlehem was a comet or the emergence of a supernova. Now, obviously, I am not qualified to dispute any of these. But what I will say is theories like these ignore a key point that Matthew is very clear about. In verse 9, Matthew writes, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. It's key. It went before them until it came to rest. In other words, that star or whatever it was was moving. It was guiding the Magi and leading them to Christ. This was no ordinary star. I would argue it was a customized supernatural light. As amazing as this supernatural phenomenon might have been, we need to understand that the Magi didn't go all that way simply to follow a star. Right? The purpose of their journey was made very clear when they arrived in Jerusalem and asked Herod, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Right? The Magi weren't just astrologers, astronomers, or scientists following a star. They were searching for something, or rather someone. Right? They were looking for a king. The question is, how could they possibly know about a king being born to the Jews at that time. Well, many scholars and commentators believe, and and I would agree, that they had read the ancient writings of Daniel. Almost 600 years earlier, Daniel had been exiled as a teenager to Babylon when Jerusalem was conquered. Now, we know from the story of, of Daniel that he eventually became an influential leader in Babylon, and during his lifetime wrote many prophecies about the Messiah, 500 years before Jesus was born. In chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, Daniel predicted that from the issuing of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the birth, life, and death of the Messiah, exactly 483 years would elapse. So the Magi knew exactly when Cyrus gave that official decree for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. So they simply added 483 years 
And that's why they were looking for a king at that particular time. They knew when. They just didn't know where. The answer to that question was found in Micah's prophecy, Micah 5.2. Matthew quotes it. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient of days. If you think about it, and I'm, I'm kind of going to go off on a bunny trail here. I know I don't usually do that, so indulge me. But if you think about it, the Magi's question to Herod, although a simple one, is extremely profound. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Or where is the Messiah? That question Where is he who has been born king of the Jews are the first recorded words spoken by a person in the entire New Testament. Think about it. In Matthew 1, only the angel Gabriel speaks. The rest is narration. The rest is references to Old Testament passages. The Magi have the first human spoken words in the New Testament. So where am I going with this? Who cares? Well, interestingly, the first question found in the Old Testament is in Genesis 3.9, when God asked Adam, where are you? Remember, Adam and Eve took the apple, they sinned, in their shame they hid from God, and so God said, where are you? That was the first question asked in the Old Testament. Now, if you think about it, the Bible is amazing. Right? In one sense, it's comprised of 66 different books written over a period of 1,500 years by different people, all inspired by God. Yet at the same time, the Bible is one book. Right? It is one complete unit with one single dominating theme running from Genesis to Revelation. The entire message of the Old Testament can be summarized, if you think about it, in the question God asks Adam and Eve when they're hiding in the garden. Where are you? Like Adam and Eve, we've all hidden from God at one time or another in our lives, right? We've all been so consumed by guilt over what we've done or said, by by shame of who we are, that we have felt unworthy of God's love and affection. And so we've hidden from him. And we see this played out over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. Humanity turning away from God, choosing their own path, and then hiding from God out of shame and guilt. The Old Testament is all about God saying to his people, where are you? Compare that to the central message of the New Testament. Instead of a holy God asking sinful humanity, where are you? In the beginning of the New Testament, in in the first gospel, at least as we've received it in the book, we have a group of men asking, where is God? And God answers the question unequivocally. He says, I took on human flesh, and I came into the world at Bethlehem in Judea. If you think about it, not much has changed in 2,000 years. We live in a world marked by an increase in spiritual hunger. People are looking for answers. They're, They're looking for God, even if they don't know they're looking for God. They're looking for something beyond themselves that can give meaning and purpose to their lives. Something beyond themselves that can give them hope. And the promise of of something beyond this short, fragile human existence. Right? Africa isn't the only mission field. Right? There is a mission field right here in Kingston. Right? In our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes. Everywhere we look, we can see people crying out to God, where are you? In all kinds of different ways. We can see people trying all kinds of different pathways to find an answer to their question. Right? These people are our family members. They're our friends. They're our neighbors. 
They don't know God. They don't know the churchy language that we know. They, they don't know Bible stories that we take for granted. They don't even know of their need for God. And the love, hope, and forgiveness that can only be found in Him. People everywhere are hungry. And they're searching. But the good news is... The good news is when it comes to God, we don't search in vain, right? We don't call out into the darkness or void only to hear the echo of our own voice. God promises us that when we seek him, we will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 reads, when you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. But if our heart is in the right place, if we are seriously looking, we don't wander aimlessly in our search for God. In fact, we don't find God at all. Right? God finds us. And like the wise men, if we are honestly and seriously and diligently seeking to find God, we will always be led to Christ. If we are honestly seriously and diligently seeking to find God, we will always be led to Christ. Right? Jesus is the goal. 1 Timothy 2, 5 reads, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 1. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He is the image of the invisible God. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to all things. Right? Jesus is the exact, the perfect, the full revelation of God. Right? If we want to know what God is like, we need only to look to Jesus. And any honest quest for God will always lead us to him. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about your own spiritual journey wherever you are in this season of your life, on this day, in this new year. Might you need to be a little bit more diligent, a little bit more serious in your search for God in this new year? Uh, Lesson number two, if we are wise, we will give God our treasure. If we are wise, we will give God our treasure. Matthew tells us that the wise men didn't just seek Jesus, kind of take a look, maybe, you know, tickle them and blow a raspberry and then go home. Matthew tells us that when they found Jesus, they worshipped him. He writes, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's a lot going on in this verse. Bowing low signals one submission to another. As having authority over them. The wise men saw in this child someone greater and wiser than themselves. They saw in this child the promised king, the Messiah, and so they humbled themselves. And not only did they bow low, they also worshipped by offering gifts that were worthy of Jesus' kingship. They didn't bring a rattle and and diapers and, and wipes and that kind of stuff that you'd expect to bring a baby. They bought gifts worthy of a king. John Stott, the great Anglican preacher, argues that the gifts of the Magi were not accidental. He says that, in fact, the wise men were so wise that each of their gifts teach us something about Christ. Stott writes, gold is the gift fit for a king. Frankincense was in constant use by the priests in the temple. Myrrh was used to embalm the dead. In those three gifts, we see who Jesus is, what he came to do, 
and what it would cost him. In those three gifts, we see who Jesus is, what he came to do, and what it would cost him. And so, if we are truly wise, like the Magi, we will open our treasures, and we will give Jesus our most valuable gifts. So first, we need to give Jesus our gold. We need to give Jesus our gold. And by gold, I mean our first and our best. Our first and our best. When we make Jesus the Lord of our lives, it means that he is our king. And if he is our king, then he is deserving of our gold, of our first fruits. Now, this involves so much more than just finances or money. It really does. I believe it involves all that we are and all that we have. However, the amount of money that we do give to the Lord can reveal whether he is king or not in our lives. And that's something that is between God and us that we need to deal with with him. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Like God deserves our first and our best, not our leftovers. Right? Not what we have left at the end of the month or after we've indulged ourselves. He deserves our first fruits. Proverbs 3 verse 9 puts it simply. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first and best part of all your income. So the question that we have to ask ourselves then is, do I give Jesus my first and my best? Number two. We need to give Jesus our incense. We need to give Jesus our incense. We need to give him our joyful worship. Our joyful worship. In verse 10, it says that the Magi were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. The message translation says they could hardly contain themselves. The Magi expressed great joy when they finally found the king and when they bowed down and worshipped him. Right? Their journey was complete. It had paid off. They'd found the one they were looking for. And so they offered their incense, their joyful worship. Right? Incense was used in the temple by priests as part of the daily ceremony and ritual. It speaks of, of the joy of worship. And like the wise men, when we bow before Jesus, there should be so much joy that we can hardly contain ourselves. A problem with worship in our contemporary, modern-day church context, regardless of what denomination we are, is that we can come to church Sunday after Sunday and never truly worship. Sure, we can sing the songs and we can say the prayers and we can come forward for communion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've worshipped. It means we've been to church. Have you ever heard someone say, or or maybe you've even said this yourself, I went to church today and I didn't get anything out of it. Right? The sermon was boring, the music was bad. I got nothing out of church today. I've probably thought that. It's really bad since I'm the one that (laughs) makes some of it happen. But this is the problem, right? This is the problem right there. We aren't here, we don't go to church to get something. If you think that's true, then you're wrong, right? We go to church to give something, right? Worship is not about us. Worship is all about, 100% about God, right? Worship is God-focused. It is not me-focused. It is not us-focused. Worship is all about giving ourselves to the Lord and not getting. I mean, yes, we receive, but that's a byproduct of our giving. That's not our, our purpose for going. We are here to worship God, not ourselves and not our own preferences, not our favorite songs or hymns, music style or denominational heritage. We are here to offer, as the prayer book says, ourselves, our souls and bodies as a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice to God. Did you catch that? We are here to offer ourselves, our souls and bodies as a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice to God. 
So let me ask you, is your experience of worship all about you and what you like and don't like? Or is it all about God and your offering to him? We give Jesus our gold, we give him our, our incense, and we give him our myrrh. We give him our life and our loyalty. As I've already said, myrrh was a spice. It was used to anoint dead bodies. Right? It was a central part of the burial rituals of the time. This gift shows that the Magi understood that Jesus was not only born to die, but that his death would be significant. Right? Myrrh reminds us of the need to offer Jesus our lives because he was willing to give up his for ours. It reminds us that we are called to die. We're called to die to self and to things of this world and to live for him. It reminds us that Jesus is Lord and not us. That he sits on the throne of our lives and that we need to submit and surrender ourselves. All that we are and all that we have to him. When we die to self or when we seek to die to self. When we lose our life in following Jesus, we demonstrate that he is king. That he's worthy of our submission and our obedience and our loyalty and our allegiance and our following. So the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is, who is the Lord of my life? Who is the Lord of my life? Is it Jesus or is it me? Who am I living my life for? The gifts of the Magi were valuable. And they were given at great cost. They symbolized the Magi's desire to submit to Jesus and worship him. What do you have to lay at the feet of Jesus this morning? And in this new year, what gifts will you bring to your king? And finally, lesson number three, once we have encountered Jesus, once we have encountered Jesus, we can't go home the same way we came. Right? We can't go home the same way we came. Verse 12 reads, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So God knew, right? God knew Herod's heart. God knew that Herod was going to use the wise men to determine the location of this newborn king, not to worship him, but so that he could destroy them, destroy him. And so he warned the Magi in a dream not to pass through Jerusalem, but to go home a different way. But the great thing is, is not only did the Magi return home by a different route, they also returned as different men. Right? This speaks of the great truth of the gospel. When we truly encounter Jesus, when we recognize who he is, when we acknowledge his lordship, we will never be the same again. Right? An encounter with Jesus changes us. And we see this throughout scripture. People from all walks of life having a life-changing encounter with Jesus. Like Peter, James, and John, Mary Magdalene, the woman caught in adultery, and the woman at the well, blind Bartimaeus, Simon the leopard, and the Gerardine demoniac, Saul of Tarsus, the Roman jailer, Cornelius. We see it throughout Scripture, and we see it today. Chris Deering, Roy Vopney, Margot Hyde, Kate Inslee, all of us. When we have an encounter with Jesus, he changes us. Right? We are all people from one degree of glory or another transformed by the mercy, love, and grace of Christ. As I said in last week's sermon, if you were here on New Year's Day, our God is a God of new beginnings and fresh starts. Right? He's all about change and transformation. Right? Paul puts it very clearly in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has gone, 
the new has come. I challenge you for this whole month, every morning when you get up and stand in the mirror, maybe you're shaving, maybe you're brushing your teeth, maybe you're quaffing your hair or putting on your eyeliner, whatever you're doing when you stand in that mirror, I want you to say to yourself, I am a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. If you say that every day, I guarantee it will have an impact on how you live your life. I am a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. The question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is having encountered Jesus today, right? He says when two or three are gathered, I am in the midst of them. Well, thankfully, there's more than two or three. So he's here today. He's in our midst by his Holy Spirit. So having encountered Jesus this morning in word and in sacrament, will you go home a different person? Will you go home a different way? And I don't mean taking King Street instead of Bath Road. I mean, will you go home changed from the inside out? And more importantly, what will that change look like tomorrow morning when you wake up? When you go to work or go to school or wherever you go? What will that change look like? I think it's appropriate that Epiphany is celebrated at this time of the year. Right? The new year provides us with an excellent opportunity to reflect on the past 12 months, on, on our successes and failures, our joys and our sorrows. And as we continue to reflect on 2016, the, the year that has passed, it might be helpful to ask, and these questions I think are on your sheet, it might be helpful to ask, in what ways did God appear to me this past year? Sort that out first. It's often in retrospect. It's like the road to Emmaus. It's looking back. Where can I see the light of his presence? How have I grown or not grown in my faith, in my relationship with God? Where do I see God leading me in 2017? And how would I describe my faith journey up to this point? How would I describe my Star Trek? The story of the wise men is an, is an intriguing one. Perhaps it's made you think, am I still in some faraway land, feeling that empty yearning inside? Or am I actively seeking Jesus? I mean, maybe you started the journey, but you've grown weary. Maybe you've gotten sidetracked or, or lost for some reason and, and can't seem to find your way. I mean, maybe you're moving forward, but it seems such a long distance to travel. Or maybe, maybe you got the camels loaded up, but you haven't really left the starting gate. Whatever it is, wherever you are, let this new year be a new beginning, a fresh start in your journey to becoming closer to the Lord. And as you journey, remember what the wise men teach us. A diligent search for God always leads to Jesus. If we're wise, we will give him our treasure. And once we've found him, we can't go home the same way. Having worshipped at the manger, we're told that the wise men carried the light of Christ out into the world with them as they return to their home. And we too are called to rise from our worship at the manger as Christmas ends and move steadily into the world by bringing the light of Christ into the places where we live and where we work, where we study and where we play. It's corny, but it's true. Wise men still seek Jesus. Wise women still seek Jesus. May 2017 be a time for all of us to carry the light of Christ and to continue to seek Jesus with all of our hearts, trusting that he's the one to guide us along the way. Amen.